Hey everyone, Azim here. We are in chapter four, starting chapter four, uh, intro to tissues and epithelial and connective tissues. This is a very big chapter. It's gonna be split up about into about five videos. Uh, this first video, we're gonna be talking about the basics of tissues and some of the basics of epithelial tissue specifically. Um, so once again, we'll be looking at uh, how epithelial tissue is organized, how connective tissue is organized, uh, what is a tissue even to begin with, uh, not necessarily the tissues used to wipe your nose, but other types of tissues that one's found in your body. And we'll take a look at histology as well. So I'll be showing you videos throughout these videos. Um, and of course, we'll be looking at this in lab. Um, I just mentioned tissues of uh, that you might use to wipe your nose or tissues like these squares of paper that you might use to make stuff out of, but individually, individually, these pieces of tissue, they don't do much. They look nice, but they're just, you know, square pieces of tissue. They're flat, they're square, they're just kind of layered on top of each other right now. They're not really doing much. Individually, these little pieces of tissue don't do much, but what you can do with these pieces of tissue is that you can arrange them, you can weave them together into a nice pattern, make it stronger, you could bunch them together in a very, very specific way to make nice flowers. My point here is, is that even when we're talking about tissues, like the paper tissues, the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. The individually, they're, they have their own properties, but they don't do much. But together, you weave them together, you put them together in a very specific way, they can do something greater. The same is true for our cells and tissues. Individual cells, they can do stuff, but together they can do more. That's what tissue is. That's what biological tissues are. Biological tissues are where you have many cells grouped together in a very specific way to form something greater. We're looking at the cellular tissue level here today because tissues are made of cells. So we're inherently going to need to look at cells. We, we need to understand tissues before we can understand organs, organ systems, and the rest of the body. So that's where we're going to start today. Uh, our definition of tissue is a group of cells of a similar origin that work together. When I say similar origin, we went over that in the last video, uh, chapter three. By origin, I mean embryonic origin. And there were three embryonic tissues that we discussed. There was ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. And from these, oops, and from these layers found in embryos, endoderm, there we go. From these layers that we found in the embryo, we discussed how they can differentiate into different tissue types. You could get skin and uh, nervous tissue with ectoderm. You can get all kinds of connective tissues and muscle with mesoderm, and then the linings of tracts with endoderm. That's a very broad way to put it, but that's what they can generally lead to. That's what I mean by, by tissues. Tissues come from these similar origins. Since we're studying tissues, uh, to really study tissues, you need to look under a microscope. The term for looking at tissue under a microscope, that's histology. I believe I introduced this term in chapter one, but here it is again. Histology is the study of tissue often under the microscope because it's so small. Let's see the really, really fine details. Because they come from the same origin and because they're of a similar cell type, they carry out a similar function. Oftentimes, not always, oftentimes they're bound with many different types of junctions. So we're gonna see how cells can be linked together. Cells sometimes are off on their own, but most of the time they're not. They're linked together, they're working together in some way with another cell. We're gonna see what these junctions are. I also wanna remind you that in between cells, there is fluid, interstitial fluid. Interstitial means in between. Uh, this fluid is just another fluid barrier to help regulate what goes in and out of a cell. Um, when you get to physiology, you'll talk all about osmolarity and tonicity. That'll be really important here. We want to regulate nutrients coming in and out. We want to regulate wastes coming in and out. This is the 
fluid space outside of a cell, interstitial fluid. And so every tissue is going to have interstitial fluid. There are four tissue types of the body. There are four tissue types. Uh, I'm briefly mentioning these here, but we're not gonna go over them in detail today. But the first two, nervous tissue, tissue that you find in your brain, spinal cord, nerves uh, of your body. These are made up of cells that control and communicate. In other words, they can conduct information, they can conduct electricity. Uh, in this illustration here, taken from Crash Course, you can see that these, these, uh, these cell shapes are often branched. And by being branched, they can communicate. They're also often very long so that they can communicate over a longer distance. So we'll see later on how form follows function, how structure relates to function of these individual nervous tissue, uh, of the cells that make up nervous tissue. But very generally, nervous tissue, these are cells made up of cells that can conduct. Muscle tissue, we all know what muscle does. Muscle helps us move things. Whether we're talking about skeletal muscle to help us move our bones and our, the rest of our body or even, even our skin to move our face, to move uh, food in our digestive tract or reproductive tract or other tracts, there's smooth muscle. Um, or our heart, cardiac muscle, uh, to pump blood throughout our body. Those are all types of muscle. And what you see with muscle is that it tends also to be longer because you want to connect from point A to point B and then shorten it. But th that's a really important thing here. To, to, for muscle tissue to work, it needs to grab onto one thing, it needs to grab onto another thing as an anchor, and then it can pull. And by pulling, it shortens. That's how muscles move things. They shorten. Another word for shorten is con to contract. So there's, we're following our alliterative mnemonic here. Uh, C is for conduct for nervous tissue. C is for contract for muscle tissue. Muscle tissue contracts. <clears throat> what we'll be focusing on in this chapter are epithelial connective. Epi means on top. So epithelial tissue is for covering and protecting. Whether it's the surface of our body, our skin, or even the linings of our tracts, our linings of our tracts, uh, they cover and protect our body in some way. Finally, connective tissue. Connective tissue connects, easy one there. Uh, what are we connecting? It could be something uh, very physically, like uh, how fat is kind of this cushioned protective layer that holds together your skin to deeper tissues. It could be um, your bone, since it's holding things in place. It could be tendons and ligaments. It could be even blood. Blood is considered a connective tissue. And I know blood is very fluid, but it's still connecting parts of your body from one place to another. It's a transport system. So there's many diverse types of connective tissues. We'll be going over them, at least some of them, a bit later in one of the later videos of this chapter. So focusing specifically on epithelial tissue, we're transitioning just to epithelial tissue right now. Here are some of the major characteristics that we, that we see in, in epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue is made of packed cells. So the cells are all crammed together. Sardines in a can, they're really packed together. We'll see in, for example, in connective tissue, the cells are very far apart from each other. They have a lot of space between each other. Here, the cells are really close. Also, their sides are specialized. Let, let me back up and let's go through this one by one. The term to describe epithel how epithelial tissue is made up of cells that are packed together, the term for that is cellularity. Cellularity. In this picture on the right here, we see one cell next to another cell. They're right next to each other. They're right next to each other. This means there's minimal space between them. There's minimal intercellular space. There's minimal interstitial fluid, another way to put it. 
another way to put it is that there's minimal interstitial fluid. So the cells are bound close together. There's not much in between them. Another consequence of this is that they're often arranged in sheets. If you have one layer of cells and they're all next to each other, you have a sheet of cells and that will have important consequences. If, we're, if we want our epithelial tissue to protect, um, has anyone played Red Rover? You know how you link up with each other to create a layer, a protective layer, and it's kind of hard to get through? That's kind of how epithelial tissue works. They're linking together and you've created a single layer, maybe, maybe multiple layers, and it's harder to get through because you have that connected layer. That's what's going on here with epithelial tissue. They're bound together, it's hard to pass through, harder to pass through, and you need some way to regulate passage of things in between. Another characteristic of epithelial tissue is that it shows sides that are specialized. One side is different from the other side. So this top side, the superficial side, the superficial side is different from the deeper side, structurally and functionally. The property, the, the term we give for this, just like how cellular, cellularity means packed together, the term for having specialized sides is polarity. Uh, you've heard this word before. We have North Pole, South Pole of magnets of the earth. There's sidedness. Uh, there's a side to a magnet, there's a side to the earth, there's a side to your cells. It has polarity. Polar means it's sided. The term for the superficial side is apical. Apical. The term for the superficial side is apical. It's exposed. It's facing the lumen or outside the body. Like if it's your skin, then the apical side is what's facing everything else. Lumen, remember, means an, an either air or fluid-filled space facing the outside of something. Like your, your esophagus has a lumen. Your trachea has a lumen. Your uterus has a lumen. It's facing the outside of your body. We've talked about cilia before. You'd find cilia on the apical side. If you're gonna sweep up mucus or sweep an egg towards the uterus in the uterine tube, that is an example of something you could find on the apical side. Not all cells have this, but these ones do. Sometimes you'll have microvilli. Microvilli, they're not cilia. Cilia have those microtubules in them. Microvilli do not have microtubules. And because they don't have microtubules, they don't move. They don't sweep like cilia. Cilia sweep. Microtubules do not move. Their purpose is to increase surface area for more, more exchange, more absorption, more secretion. By having more surface area, you get more exchange. So you'll find this, for example, in your intestines where you're absorbing nutrients, secreting stuff so that you can digest stuff. That's one good example where you can find it. In short, the apical side is where you can find some interesting structures. The basal side though, the basal side is the base, the bottom. The basal side, this is more of an attachment point. You want to make sure you don't want your sheet of cells to lift off willy nilly. That's not great. That's how a blister, for example, is where you get your cells to lift off. And a blister happens because you have damage, whether because of sunburn or, or other burn or uh, it's another way to get blister, friction burn, any kind of burn, any kind of damage to your cells that can cause damage to your basal layer. Um, this is an attachment surface. To, well, when you wanna attach something in everyday life, you can use tape or glue, for instance. Uh, we're not using specifically tape or glue to tape our cells down, but we need some kind of biological thing for our cells to attach to the, to, to the connective tissue that's deeper to it. 
to connect our cells, our epithelial cells to deeper tissues, we need a special protein mixture. That protein mixture is referred to as the basement membrane. I mentioned how proteins can have many different functions. One function is for attachment. These epithelial cells attach deeper to these proteins, kind of like a sticky glue, kind of. That's the basement membrane. It's a protein mixture that the epithelium sits on top of and adheres to. That's what you can find on the basal side. So two important characteristics so far, it has cellularity, epithelial tissue has cellularity and polarity. To further demonstrate that, here is an actual image of histology, actual tissue that we're looking at here. Um, if you're curious where this is from, this is probably, looks like pseudostratified. This is probably from the trachea. Uh, I'll explain why that, why that is later, but you can see here, these are cilia on the apical side. What's been, what has been outlined here, and so sorry, this is the lumen of the trachea, so this is the airspace. What's been outlined here in yellow, and what I'm coloring now in green, is the epithelial tissue layer. What we'll notice about epithelial tissue is that look at the color difference between here, what I labeled as epithelium, and here, what I'm going to label as connective tissue. Look at the color difference. Epithelium tends to be darker. There are some exceptions. Some exceptions I can point out like right here, how this cell is lighter than the others. We'll get to that later. But generally epithelium looks darker than, than the rest. When you stain cells, when you stain tissues, the thing that usually stains the darkest are nuclei. Nuclei stain dark. So when you look and you see many nuclei next to each other, overall, you get an appearance of these cells. Let me outline a single cell. You get the appearance of cells looking darker. These tissues look darker. Epithelial tissue therefore looks darker because you have so many cells packed next to each other. And you can see all these individual cells, use a different color, we'll use black. You can see all these individual cells packed next to each other, one after another, after another, after another, after another. We have cellularity. These have cilia on the apical side and it's attached to the basement membrane, uh, colored there in yellow attached to the basement membrane. It's just a very, very thin strip. You can't really tell. You can just assume that it's there. But these cells are attached to the basement membrane on the basal side. Deep to that is connective tissue. We'll get to that in a few more videos. What we'll also discuss is how these cells are connected to each other. There are these junctions that hold everything together. So we'll see that in a minute. <clears throat> Two more uh, properties of epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue, since it's always exposed to the surface, whether it's outside the outside world or tracts where there could be lots of friction or damage or bacteria or harmful viruses, toxins, stuff that could damage us, epithelial tissue dies pretty frequently. Because it dies pretty frequently, we want to regenerate it quickly as well. It has a high rate of mitosis. Epithelial tissue can regenerate quickly. It has a high rate of mitosis. If we take a sample of tissue and look for cells undergoing mitosis, we would find a lot of them in the epithelium. Other tissues can undergo mitosis as well. The rate is higher for epithelial tissue. So great, we can replace cells quickly. One downside is that the more we try to replace our cells, the more likely it is, just there's more chance, there's more probability that we can have an error in making more cells. 
uh, that's and that's what can lead to cancer. Um, a quick analogy of this is like, say you have uh, a page of a book that you need to copy over and over and over again. Say you're typing it out or writing it out. Sometimes you mess up, right? Sometimes you make a typo. You can go back and fix it, but sometimes you miss your mistake. Now imagine your cells are make trying to make more cells. To do that, they have to make more DNA. DNA is literally a sequence of these special molecules, nucleic acids. That sequence sometimes gets messed up. Your cells can make mistakes. If you if your cells can't catch those mistakes and you keep those mistakes going, that can lead to things like cancer. Epithelial tissue needs to regenerate quickly to replace cells that have lost. Since your epithelium is so exposed, you don't want to bleed out. So you don't want to have blood vessels near the surface of your, your skin or lining your tracts, like near the superficial side. Your epithelial tissue, therefore, is avascular. The word vascular, vascular or vasculature is referring to blood vessels. So if we're referring to avascular tissue, the A means without. Uh, if, it, if it had a vowel, if vascular had a vowel to start with, then you would put an, like anaerobic, but A or an means without. So avascular means without blood vessels. You want to limit blood, blood, blood loss in case of injury. If I, I can scratch my skin. I'm scraping off dead cells right now, fun thought, but I'm not bleeding because I did not go deep enough to damage blood vessels. I don't want to demonstrate that. <laughs> but I'm sure it's happened to you at some time when you've fallen or something. You've damaged it so deep that you finally get to the blood vessels. But just scratching on the surface, I can scratch the inside of my cheek. I, I would just be removing the dead layers of, of epithelial cells. I would not be getting to blood vessels because your epithelial tissue is avascular. Your cells still need nutrients, though. So your epithelial cells rely on transport through interstitial fluid to get to your cells and, and feed them. This means that if you have epithelial tissue that's layered, let's say you've got some cells here and then more cells here. Let's do one more, more cells here. And this is superficial. And this way is deep. So you have blood vessels right here. If you want to get nutrients to these um, cells, it would have to leave the blood into the interstitial fluid and make its way to the cell. These are the ones that are deeper, your epithelial cells that are deeper are more nourished. They get nutrients more easily the ones that are more superficial are less nourished. They die faster. Which is actually fine. They are more superficial. They're more expendable. They sc scrape off like scales and they're protecting the deeper layers. They're doing their job. So it's actually a great thing that the superficial layers die quickly. They're not getting as many nutrients. Um, Want to point out interstitial fluid, but yeah, it's a good thing that they're dying quickly because they're protecting us. As I've mentioned, because epithelial tissue is the barrier between the outside world and you, deeper into you, we need to regulate the transport of molecules into and out of the body. We want to protect ourselves from abrasion. We want to protect ourselves from losing water, from dehydration, protect ourselves from harmful things in the world like toxins and pathogens. We can regulate, oh, I'm sorry, the, the word epidermis, this is the superficial layer of your skin. We'll get to that later. Epi means on top, dermis is referring to a skin layer. And you can actually see that right here. It's this layer. 
but we can regulate the passage of things into and out of our body, if you recall from chapter two, with protein transporters and also with junctions. So we'll talk about junctions now, some junctions that you will be introduced to. <clears throat> Oops, we're on slide 11. Did I go too far? These transitions. Okay, slide 11. One example of a junction is called an adhering junction. You might see it called adherens. We'll call it adhering. It means the same thing. The word to adhere means to stick to. So this is a sticky junction. It allows cells to be more stabilized. I've pointed it out here in yellow, and I'm pointing out in green where these junctions are. If this is a layer of cells, of epithelial cells, they're more towards the apical side. So they're stabilizing neighboring cells like that Red Rover thing they're linking together, but not so tightly. This is like a light, a light glue. It's like a light glue. It's making sure that every, all these cells that are supposed to stay next to each other stay next to each other, that one just doesn't go off somewhere else on its own. We want them to stick together. Adhering junction is a type, this is made of a protein. So here's another type of protein. All these junctions are proteins, just a heads up. So adhering junctions are just so cells can stick together. There's nothing quite yet to do with transport. These are cells, so cells stick together. Our next example is a desmosome. Desmosome. A desmosome is a much tighter link. Adhering junction was lightly sticky. Desmosomes, desmosomes are like hitches on a truck or a train. Uh, when you're pulling something with a truck, like if you're pulling like a, a U-Haul trailer, if you're pulling a trailer with a truck, you want that link to be very secure. You don't want that to just fall off because yeah, that would be bad. When our cells are linked together, if, if one pulls, then the rest are pulled with it. That ensures that even with some force on our body, our cells stay together. There's obviously some limits to this, but we don't want our cells to just rip off from one another so easily. We want some resilience between our cells. That's what these desmosomes allow for. They appear at locations of high mechanical stress, which is a lot, of, a lot of places in your body, especially in your skin and some of your and many of your tracts. There's a special type. Desmosomes are between cells laterally. Desmosomes are between cells laterally. A special type of desmosome is attaching to the basement membrane, which I've colored here in pink. This is a hemidesmosome. It's the same thing. It's just instead of between cells, it's from the cell down to the basement membrane. So hemidesmosomes are a type of desmosome. They're just kind of half of one since you only have one cell involved. <clears throat> a tight junction a tight junction is kind of like a Ziploc seal. When you have liquid, let's say you put liquid in a Ziploc bag, if it's a really good bag, you can flip it over and the liquid won't spill out, right? That's what this seal is right here. We're preventing interstitial fluid from leaking out. I'm going to color in, uh, if you look at my drawing down here, I'm coloring in interstitial space. So hypothetically, you could have water come this way and out of the cell. So it could just leak out. You could lose water this way. That's one possibility. 
we want to minimize that. We don't want to just lose all of our water. We need water to survive. To prevent leakage of interstitial fluid, to prevent dehydration, you have these tight junctions in between cells. But sometimes we want to have materials pass between cells. We can add little bit, little channels from one cell to another. So if I want to have a molecule of something pass from one cell to the other, whether it's, well, it could be water, it could be ions, but I can have one thing pass from one cell to the other. We want protein channels in between the cells. These special channels are called gap junctions. Gap junctions. It's for having things pass from one cell to another. Four junction types that I'd like you to know for now. Once again, gap junctions help stuff transport in between cells. Tight junctions help limit what can pass out. L let me actually reiterate one thing here about tight junctions. Because tight junctions prevent anything from coming this way, you're forcing molecules to have to pass through the cell in order to get into your body. And for it to pass through the cell, that means you need special membrane transporters. You're adding steps of regulation here. You're forcing things to have to go through the cell, meaning they have to go through membrane transporters, meaning more regulation. And that's good for your body because you don't want to just let anything into your body. Gap junctions for things between cells, tight junctions to prevent things from passing in between, and therefore you're regulating it further with membrane transporters. Going back to slide 12, desmosomes and hemidesmosomes to provide tight linking between each other and with the basement membrane, and adhering junctions, just a light glue to help things stay fairly secure. In the next video, we'll talk about the different types of epithelium. What we just went over now are characteristics that you see in all epithelial types. So I'll see you in the next video. If you need to, please rewatch this. Uh, hopefully the subtitles make sense and uh, leave questions in the discussion.